On our broadcast tonight, hacked top government websites in this country and elsewhere are crippled, but the feds don't know where the attack came from, and it's not just computers that are at risk. Bang for the buck, after all that talk about shovel-ready projects ready to dig to make America better, where did the billions in stimulus money go? Hitting the bottle, wait till you find out what an environmental group is saying about bottled water and what the government might do. And striking up the band in a town facing hard times, making a real difference through music. Nightly News begins now. From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. Good evening. When we talk about national security, we're usually thinking about troops and tanks and ships and planes, hardware and not software. But our lead story tonight may change that thinking. Our nation's been hit by a major attack, and it's computer-based. 35 important websites, government and private sector, have been hit and hit badly in the U.S. and South Korea since July 4th. The attacks include the Department of Homeland Security and the Pentagon, and they show a certain vulnerability. We begin tonight with Pete Williams at the Department of Homeland Security in Washington. Pete, good evening. Brian, government and private industry experts say this attack was unusually intense and long-lasting, and they're scrambling tonight to find out where it came from. Among the targets were the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, both of which say they successfully fought it off. But it swarmed the public websites of at least a dozen U.S. government agencies, including the White House. Two of them, for the Federal Trade Commission and the Transportation Department, were out of commission for at least two days. If this was meant as a message by whoever is responsible for it, the message has been received. America's guard is up, and uh, uh, our defenses uh, will get stronger and stronger. Experts call it an unusually large denial-of-service attack, with the originator sending out signals to enlist up to 60,000 computers that ganged up on the targeted websites, overwhelming them with millions of messages. Government operations like air traffic control were untouched, and the attack appears not to have targeted any other critical private sector systems like those controlling power lines or public water systems. But government websites were also hit in South Korea. Its intelligence agency says it believes the attack may have originated in North Korea. American officials say the source is unknown. U.S. government websites are constantly targeted, and intelligence agencies have robust defenses. But the former top U.S. intelligence computer expert says there's no government-wide security requirement. I am in favor of, of federal standards, uh, but uh, oftentimes uh, within the federal government, uh, each agency uh, uh, sets its, its standards about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Pete Williams reporting to start us off from Washington tonight and a related story on security. Recently, the federal government set out to find out how safe government buildings are. It's a test of the system. Tonight, we have learned the system failed. We get more on this story from NBC's Kelly O'Donnell on Capitol Hill tonight. Kelly, good evening. Good evening, Brian. One senator said he won't be able to sleep at night after what we heard here today. There's a new report that shows serious weaknesses in security at federal buildings. So serious, real bombs got past the guards. You're watching a security breach. Government investigators shot these pictures as they carried bomb-making materials through security at a federal building. Ten times at ten different buildings, guards failed to detect explosives that officials say could do this. Hiding in federal building restrooms, investigators put together improvised explosive devices that could be even more powerful. They assembled the IED and walked freely around several floors of the facilities into various executive and legislative branch offices with the device in a briefcase. Senators were disturbed. I'm in one of those buildings. <laughs> There's hundreds of people in there. The Federal Protective Service provides guards at 2,300 federal buildings nationwide. How do you explain to yourself um, how these things were allowed to happen? It's purely a lack of oversight on our part. Investigators found serious lapses. For example, 
411 of 663 guards reviewed at random had at least one expired firearms qualification. And at one building, 75% of guards on duty had expired certifications or no record of training. And officials provided this photo of a sleeping guard they claim was on the painkiller Percocet. Today, the agency said more money and manpower is needed. We have taken steps in the right direction to get us there. And Brian, we're talking about 13,000 guards, and they are not federal employees, but contractors hired by the government to work in these special facilities. They are federal buildings all across the country, and they were not identified today. And one official I spoke to said it will be even more than a year to get them all trained and up and running. Brian? Kelly O'Donnell on Capitol Hill for us tonight. Kelly, thanks. Depending on where you live and where you drive, sometimes you see them at construction sites. Signs that are designed to herald the stimulus money being spent on new roads and on-ramps and the like. It was a lot of money, $787 billion in the end. It was five months ago. It was supposed to fix and build a lot of things and put a lot of people to work during a time of high unemployment. And the White House is saying, be patient. The story tonight from our senior investigative correspondent, Lisa Myers. At this road project in Maryland, a sign tells all who pass by that the money for repaving came from the stimulus package. The Obama administration has encouraged states to put up the signs, which can be plan, but are not ruling that out. Lisa Myers, NBC News, Washington. The economy is just one of the items on the president's agenda at the G8 summit in Italy tonight, but the most pressing issue for the group of eight just might be aftershocks. The summit, after all, is taking place near L'Aquila, the town still experiencing rumblings from that massive earthquake back in April. Our chief White House correspondent, Chuck Todd, traveling with the president with us from Rome this evening. Chuck, good evening. Well, good evening, Brian. Well, first, a little bit of news out of these summits. You know, there's always a lot of declarations uh, and sometimes commitments and pledges. But there was one very serious issue the president wanted to bring to the table this summit, and that is Iran. And the G8, which is made up of America's six closest Western allies, plus a sometimes adversary, Russia, collectively urged Iran to respond to these diplomatic overtures, get to the table to discuss this nuclear issue, and if they and give and is giving Iran until September to do it. If they don't, the next time the G8 meets, which will be in September, they will possibly take these uh, take this issue further with Iran. Maybe it'll be sanctions. But it was a tougher statement than the U.S. expected to get, and they feel like that means that the president made progress in Russia during the two-day stop. And as you brought up, Brian. Uh, this summit has taken place in L'Aquila, and today the president toured this earthquake-ravaged area with Silvio Berlusconi. Uh, and what's interesting is if there is a major aftershock, there is a very detailed evacuation plan that will helicopter these world leaders out of there, Brian. All right, Chuck Todd in Rome tonight. Chuck, thanks. We want to reemphasize the leaders are, of course, in no danger. As Chuck said, there's a plan to get them out, and they're scheduled to leave soon anyway. But then there are the people who live in that town. We first met some of them back when our own Martin Fletcher arrived to cover the awful aftermath of the quake. Today, Martin went back to see how those familiar faces were faring. This is not when Marius and Simona planned to get married. Three months after the earthquake destroyed their home, they're still in a refugee camp. But it's a rare moment of joy among the 25,000 Italians still living in tents. They live in fear. There are tremors. Martin Fletcher, NBC News, L'Aquila, Italy. Let's wish them well. When our broadcast continues along the way, on a Wednesday night, there's a new hot spot on Earth tonight, as the show of force there again showed clearly today. And later, he made it big, but he never forgot where he came from. Now he's using music to make a difference. Solemn day today at Dover Air Force Base as the bodies of five U.S. servicemen came home, the most at one one time since coverage of such arrivals resumed about three months ago. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mike Mullen, was on hand for it. The five, four soldiers and a sailor, 
were all killed in Afghanistan Monday, most of them in different regions. It was the single deadliest day that war has seen in almost a year. We've been reporting here this week on the violent unrest that has claimed more than 150 lives in western China. Authorities now have the place under lockdown, but they've allowed some media in for a closer look, and our own Ian Williams is there tonight. They flooded into Urumqi this morning, a massive and calculated show of force. The Chinese government determined police, but the atmosphere remains tense and volatile. Ian Williams, NBC News, Urumqi. Up next as we continue, did you know bottled water is hundreds of times more expensive than tap? Is it that much better? We'll tell you why the feds may get involved after this. The commercials would have us believe that bottled water flows right from a mountain spring right into the bottle with the snow gently melting and bunnies hopping around. The, the commercials would also have us believe that it's certainly better than tap water. But is that true? And what's really in it considering so many people pay so much to have it? Our own Tom Costello is in our Washington bureau with more on this. Tom, good evening. Hi, Brian. Two new reports out today suggest consumers know a lot more about the water in their tap than the bottled water they pay so much for. And we drink a lot of bottled water. In fact, 28 gallons per person per year, paying hundreds of times more for bottled water than we do for tap water. But the Environmental Working Group looked at 200 popular brands of water and found that fewer than 2% disclose the water source. While the EPA requires municipalities to report what's in the water in our taps, the FDA doesn't require bottlers to tell us what's in their water or where it originates from. Now, government investigators said bottlers today should be required to provide more thorough labeling. Congress now looking at beefing up those labeling requirements. Meanwhile, Brian, researchers today said that maybe bottled water should be a distant second choice for you as your water source, not a primary source. They insist tap water is usually very clean. All right, Tom Costello from our Washington Bureau tonight. Tom, thanks. Speaking of the environment, look what Greenpeace did to Rushmore and Abe Lincoln today. Three Greenpeace climbers rappelled down the mountain to hang a 65-foot-tall banner featuring President Obama's face. There were 12 arrests of environmental activists. They say they timed their message to coincide with that G8 conference underway in Italy and to remind the president that great presidents show leadership. Something else happens today that only happens every 100 years or so. Two brief moments today lasted just one second each. It was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, meaning that just after half past midnight and again afternoon at exactly 12, 34, and 56 seconds, today, June 8th of 2009, became one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of 09. And if you're into numbers and sequences, it was a heck of a moment, two of them actually. When we come back here tonight, tonight's final story came to us from a nightly news viewer. It's about a man who's making a difference. Week after week, Meet the Press follows the issues challenging top newsmakers to explain and defend their positions. For more than 60 years, you've relied on us to be fair and to get it right every Sunday morning. This is the tradition of NBC News. Making a difference. Brought to you by GlaxoSmithKline. Today's medicines, tomorrow's miracles. We're back. Our Making a Difference report tonight came from a viewer of this broadcast. And by the way, we continue to ask you to send us the stories you know about, the stories about people performing random or regular acts of kindness for others. This is one such story tonight. It's a guy who made it big, came home to make things right, in this case by using music. Our report from NBC's Ron Mott in Waverly, Tennessee. Yeah, sit down here, honey. Okay. At 68, Ron Pace enjoys a relaxing semi-retirement with his wife Sandy in Music City, Nashville. Far from a musician, Pace had an idea nine years ago. Ron Mott, NBC News, Waverly, Tennessee. And that's our broadcast for this Wednesday night. Thank you for being with us. I'm Brian Williams. We hope to see you back here tomorrow evening. Good night.